Repentance and Faith. This is part four and will be the conclusion of this series. For now, although as perhaps most of you realize, this really is the theme of the gospel, repentance and faith. This is the story of the Bible, repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Turn with me to our subject text again in Acts 20, where Paul was reminding the Christians at Ephesus of his ministry and of what he had preached to them. In verse 25, he said, And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So he gave it a title of the kingdom of God. In verse 20, he said, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. So he claims to have preached everything that was of good to them, of good benefit to these people. And then he adds in verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I guess we have seen in the last few uh, services that modern day Israel certainly needs to repent toward God and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a nation and as a people, we have gotten so far away from the commandments of God and from his law that we need repentance. And that literally is what repentance means, a turning away from disobedience to God's law and a turning to obedience to his law. And when we use the term law, of course, we know that we use that word in relation not just to the Ten Commandments, but to the statutes and the judgments and those things taught by the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. This is the whole law of God. The major problem, I think, in America, and this is true among our brethren in Europe, is that so few ministers actually teach the law, or teach what the law and the commandments are, that the vast majority of our, of our people simply do not know how we are in violation. You tell them that we are in sin and iniquity, and they say, oh, I know, uh, liquor consumption is terrible, and a lot of people smoke, and there are a lot of babies born before they get married, and things like that. And they see many of these sins, but they do not see the national sins of Israel as a people. They do not see that because the law is not taught. And as we read in some of the Law and the Prophets, one of the greatest condemnations of Israel were the errors of economics, in other words, economic injustice, robbery, and plunder of the people. Turn with me to Ezekiel 20, where God Almighty had spoken to the prophet to go to Israel, and as we saw in our study before the church service this morning, Ezekiel was sent to the Israel people in the captivity. So they had understood that because of their sin and iniquity, they'd already gone into captivity. They knew judgment was coming upon them and had come upon them. And in verse 4, God says to Ezekiel, Wilt thou judge them, son of man, wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. We have to learn wherein the past generations got away from God's word and began to commit these abominations in order to understand what we are doing. And we must also see that the abominations and the violations of God's law are not necessarily something we have done which no one else has done before us. This is something that has gone on in Israel generation after generation. And if we see where the error began some time ago, we can see where it is now. As an example today, I think some of you have found this out when you try to teach people the error of the present economic system. Well, this present Babylonian system of usury and debt has been with us so long that there is no one living who has ever lived under any other system. So you see, the only way we can recognize the error of the present system is to go back a hundred or two hundred years and point out where they were doing, what they were doing then, and where they turned and began to do it wrong. To try to turn to the present system today and tell people, well, this present economic system is terrible. The injustice and the robbery and the plunder is terrible. They do not know anything about a previous system, so they just 
look out here and they say, why, look at all these wonderful homes and look at these beautiful farms and these buildings. You mean to tell me this system is bad? You see, you have to go back to our fathers. Literally, you have to go back to the Bible and find out what we should have done in order to find out what we are doing wrong today. Now, we read some of this. Micah 6 is a good example of God telling Israel what their sins were. Micah 6 and verse 10. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. And several other prophets brought the same message to our fathers in Israel. You have allowed robbery and violence in the land to destroy my people. And many of the people involved in criminal justice today are beginning to see that the iniquities of the system at the top are the major thing which is breeding crime among the people. The economic system imposed on us from the top is one of the major reasons why people rob and plunder at the bottom. A man goes out and holds up a bank or a grocery store and robs from it. He says, well, look at all my rulers and leaders. They are stealing all the time. I guess I might as well, too. And some of our society has decided that, well, the best way to get what you want is to just go out and take it because, after all, look what the president is involved in and look what other people are involved in. We have become a nation of criminals because, to some extent, of the criminality at the top. And our corrupt rulers do take today about 45% of the wealth produced by the people. They actually take it from them in taxes every year. And as far as I know, and I know most of you know this too, there isn't one church in a thousand in America that actually protests the robbery of the people by their rulers. Now, there are about 300,000 churches in America. If you can provide me the names of 300 ministers who protest this robbery of the people, then I'll take that statement back, that not one in a thousand ever says one word against this greatest of all robberies, the robbery of the wealth produced by the honest working people of the nation and taken from them. I'm not talking about the man who beats his neighbor over the head and steals some equipment or his automobile. I'm talking about the greatest robbery in the history of the world. Forty-five percent of the working man's wealth in America is taken from him every year. And that is taken from us primarily by what has become a Jewish government and a Jewish banking system. And all the ministers can talk about is how we're supposed to love the Jews or God will curse us. Every year, thousands of radio broadcasts, tens of thousands of sermons, hundreds of thousands of books, and millions of little tracts flood America addressed to American Christians you must love the Jews. Don't you object to or interfere with anything the Jews are doing because the Jews are God's chosen people, and if you oppose them in any way, God will curse you. And yet if we read God's word, God condemns everything that we now see this Jewish government and this Jewish banking system doing to us, robbing and plundering our people. As we saw last week from the book, The Bible as History, that ancient Babylon ran a commercial system. It was a commercial enterprise system, which was a system of usury, of debts, and of vice. They robbed the people by charging, according to that author, an average of 20% interest on loans. Now, I speculated, and perhaps this is something we can keep in mind, that we may reach a point where they're charging 20% interest on loans in America before this modern Babylon collapses. And still, I suppose, even then, the ministers will be telling us how this economic system has brought us all of these goods and services that we enjoy. 
Now here is a writing by Martin Luther, and this is quoted in my open letter to ministers who believe the Jews are Israel, in which he wrote almost 500 years ago about economic bondage in what we know today as Germany. Quote, he's referring to the Jews. I should make this point. He's already written about it, and then I quote from there on. Why they hold us Christians in captivity in our own country, they let us work in the sweat of our noses while they appropriate money and goods, live well and easy on goods for which we have worked, keep us and our goods in captivity through their cursed usury, mock us and spit on us, because we must labor and permit them to be noblemen at our expense. Thus they are our lords and masters, we their servants, with our own property, sweat, and labor. Now, that is Martin Luther writing 500 years ago. You'd think he was here writing about the present system today. And then he closes, And to thank us and reward us, they curse our Lord. And they do. If you have watched any number of movies in the last 30 years, you should have recognized the anti-Christian, anti-Jesus blasphemy which is in them. It used to be very subtle. It used to be the way they mocked our Jesus was to have a minister in there and make him a crook or a secret alcoholic or something like that. But now they actually come out and ridicule Jesus Christ in movies. They have made movies which blaspheme Jesus Christ, even while, as Luther said, they rob and plunder our people, and then to pay us they mock, they mock our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our religious leaders today not only do not protest this economic bondage, but as I just said, they also tell us these people who are robbing us are God's chosen people. And they tell us how much we have benefited by having them among us. And they point to such things as vaccines, salt vaccine and Einstein and some of those things. Many of them should have known that Einstein stole his theories from a non-Jew who had worked out all the mathematics in advance. Einstein didn't have the brains to write what he wrote. It was written by someone else. But anyway, they have also put upon us a false religion by insinuating their false religion of Babylon into our seminaries many years ago. We now have a false religion. Turn to Zechariah 7, Zechariah 7, verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Now he's talking about Israel, because the rebuke is to Israel, not to the non-Israelites. I wish we could get that through our heads, that the error and the sin and the plunder and the thievery and the robbery may be upon us because of non-Israelites, but it is Israel that God tells to correct it. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. When Israel was in sin, what did God accuse them of not hearing? He accused them of not hearing the law. He told them in other places, as you know, that they went to Bethel and Gilgal and they offered all of their sacrifices, but they would not hear the law. They did have religion, and we have religion. According to statistics this morning, about 50 to 60 percent of our race is in some religious establishment somewhere supposedly worshiping the God of Israel. We have religion. But he said, no, they refuse to hear my law. Well, now before we close here, we should read the law I've been talking about back in Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 and 20. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury. 
you are not to lend money at interest in the land of Israel. That is a command. That is a law of God Almighty. And here is part of the reason that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. God will bless you if you do not lend on usury. And of course, the other side of the coin is that God will bring judgment upon you if you do. Turn to Deuteronomy 15. Here is another part of that because Israel was told to lend to the poor. When the poor needed something, they were to lend it. They were not to charge usury, but they were to lend it. And then, to take care of that, Deuteronomy 15, beginning in verse 1. At the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. Cancel the debt at the end of seven years. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. This is God's release. This is a law. This is a commandment of God. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, but that which is thine with thy brother thine hand shall release. No Israelite is to be charged for any debt that goes seven years without payment. It is to be canceled. Do you realize that what that would do with this so-called national debt that we have and all these other mortgages and debts that we have in America? When the seven-year cycle comes around, all canceled. And that's why I have said in the book I wrote about this, we're not talking about paying off the debts of America. We're talking about cancellation. They will be canceled. Save when, and this should have been translated, to the end that there shall be no poor among you. You do not charge interest on money, and what money you do lend, or anything that you lend to someone, if they pay it back, that's fine. But if they can't pay it back, and seven years goes by, it's canceled. And that is not seven years from the time of the lending. By the way, it's a seven-year cycle. You may have lent it only last year, but if the seven-year cycle is up this year, it's canceled. The reason was to eliminate poverty in the land. Isn't it something? We have a tremendous health, education, and welfare uh, section of our United States government, which actually spends more money than any other department of the government and most of it is spent, is spent, supposedly, to eliminate poverty in the land. And God says you eliminate poverty by no interest charge on money and cancel debts every seven years, and you'll eliminate poverty. But we won't have it, and the churches won't preach it. For the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. For the Lord thy God blesses thee as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. The contrary side of that would be that if we lend money at interest and do not cancel debts at the end of every seven years, what would happen? We would be in debt and other nations would reign over us. Isn't that something? You know, many of our patriotic Americans are coming to an understanding that America is ruled by aliens. But because of the fact that very few churches teach God's law, they do not understand that alien rule over our people is a consequence of our disobeying God's economic laws. Some of them think, well, we're in the straits that we're in because we have too much drinking and smoking or because they don't go to the Baptist church often enough or every week. No, that is not the cause of alien rule over Israel. The cause of alien rule over Israel is because Israel refuses to obey God's laws, statutes, and judgments. And we read last week, and I think you'll see more of this in our newspapers, about the stranger devouring our land. The aliens coming in here, taking jobs, even taking government jobs and ruling over us. I was watching television news the other night, and I do not remember the exact story, but it had something to do 
with an interview of government employees here in our state government, and they interviewed about seven of them, and there was not one white person among those seven. Every one of those seven government employees were Mexicans, Negroes, or something. Some were Indians, of course. The strangers devour our land, and Israel knows it not. Turn to Jeremiah 7. Another prophet to the Israel people when they were in sin and iniquity, starting in verse 1. And the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Isn't that interesting that God told him to stand in the gate of the place of worship and tell those people to turn to God? Today we would say the great need in America would be to stand on the porch of the churches as they come into the churches and tell them they are in sin and iniquity. That's what he was told to do. Verse 5, For if ye truly amend your ways and your doings, if ye truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers, forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. These people were going into the temple and apparently trusting what the priest told them in the temple. And God says, no, you're trusting in lying words. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. What was Israel's sin? It was economic injustice, yes. But at the same time, while they were doing that, they turned right around and came right into the temple and said, Well, because we come to the temple, we are free and we can continue to do what we're doing. Just as millions, millions of our people today go into the churches and they say, Oh, I've gone in there and I've confessed Christ and I've accepted Jesus as my Savior and now everything is fine. No, God says you trust in lying words because you are still robbing and plundering and murdering and deceiving in the land. You see, there's an old saying, and it's been used for propaganda to some extent, that no man is an island. The implication being that no matter what you do, it affects everyone else. And that is true, and it's especially true, in relation to God's law. Many of our church-going people ha have been given to understand that if they themselves become a quote-unquote Christian, that that's all that's necessary. Don't worry about the sin and corruption out there in the street and in the city and in the state and the nation. God doesn't look at it that way. God looks to his people and tells them they are responsible as a people for what is going on in the land. And especially you people who go to church, just like Jeremiah was told. He didn't tell him to go out into the city. He said, go and stand in the gate of the temple and tell these people who are coming into the temple these things. Now notice here he referred to uh, this house which is called by my name. Verse 11. <clears throat> is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Turn with me to John 2. That should have reminded you of an incident in Jesus' life. John 2, Jesus goes into the temple in Jerusalem. We'll begin reading in verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. 
And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep, and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus went in, and this is the only time where he actually used physical violence against men. And where did he use it? In the temple against people who were doing something in the temple that was wrong. And it says here, he poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. Now, I've heard this and seen this interpreted many ways. First of all, to take care of the oxen and the sheep and the doves. These apparently were people there who were selling these animals for sacrifices. People could come in and buy the animal to, to then offer as a sacrifice for their sin. It was the same thing that the Catholic Church did when they sold indulgences. You pay so much to the priest and he absolves your sin. Well, now Israel was supposed to offer animals, but they were supposed to offer the best of their flock. According to historians of this time, these people there at the temple sold animals that had been maimed and were of little value. So they were not offering what they were supposed to offer. And then this word tables here should have been translated something else. It is a Greek word, trapeza, and here is the whole definition in Strong's Concordance. A table or stool, usually for food, also a counter, figuratively a broker's office for loans at interest a broker's office for loans at interest. And we'll see from another use of it in the New Testament that is what it should have been translated to mean. Here in uh, John 2 and in Matthew 11 are the only two places in the New Testament where this word, trapeza, is translated table. The same word, or almost the same word, is used in Matthew 25 in the parable of the unfaithful servant. Matthew 25, verse 27, he's speaking to the servant, Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. And the word exchangers there is from this same Greek word translated tables in John 2. And then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. So the Greek word means literally a method of lending money at usury, translated tables in John 2. So Jesus overturned the records, the books of the money changers. What did he do? He canceled all debts because without their records they couldn't collect their debts, right? That's what Jesus did in the temple. Now I'll speak about my fellow ministers again. And most of you know that they preach out of Matthew 25, and they say that Jesus told this man, commanded this man, that he should have put the money out at usury. Therefore, usury or interest is now legal because Jesus made it legal. No, if you'll read the whole context, Jesus was telling him, you thought I was a thief, why didn't you put my money out at interest and steal for me? So Jesus instead was calling usury thievery. And so when Jesus went into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers, he literally destroyed their records so they could not collect the debts. Now I believe there is great significance in that, and I believe that is going to happen in the end of the age when the modern system of Babylon which has fastened itself upon God's Israel people, is destroyed. There will be a destruction of the records of the money changers. They'll be gone. There will be no record of the debts. The debts will be canceled. Now, many people look at the computers as the banks are putting them in, and they're transferring almost all of their records to computers, as you know. And so all of these things are, are being put in computers for space and for time and so on. But some of them do know 
that computers hold their records through an electrical means. In other words, they're put on these disks or on tape or whatever by electricity, which then uses the magnetism of the object that is put on there, and it's placed on there. The record is there by electricity. Well, those who were here at our, uh, at our class just before the church service, I won't be able to go over all of this again, but we discussed what scientists have discovered that the Ark of the Covenant was, in effect, an electrical generator, that electricity was actually generated in the Holy of Holies in the old tabernacle. And that is why the priest had to go through a certain ritual before he could go in there. That was why no one could touch the ark because they would be killed. And you remember when they brought the ark back from the Philistines at the time of David, that the ox cart ran over a rock or something and the ark looked like it was falling off and a man touched it and he died. God told Israel, anyone touching the ark would die. Well, if it is true that the presence of God and God's holiness is a tremendous manifestation of what we, in our layman's language, call electricity, I wonder if they've ever thought of the possibility that a tremendous charge of electricity which might be manifested at the return of Jesus Christ would wipe out all the computers in the world and there would be no memories on them, there would be no records, no bank records. Now, that's pure speculation on the part of Pastor Emery, but it is not speculation on my part that the debts will be canceled, these debts which have been fastened upon us by this system of Babylon. Well, let's go on a little bit about what Jesus was referring to here when he's talking about his house. Instead of being a house of prayer, it was made a den of thieves. Turn with me to Ephesians where Paul is writing to the Christian Israelites at Ephesus, and he says this in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, verses 19 through 22. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So the whole house of Israel is the house of God, is the temple of God. So if the fulfillment of Jesus driving out the money changers from that old stone temple in Jerusalem will be manifested again at the end of this age, it will be the destruction of the money changers and their records in the whole house of Israel at this end of the age, because Israel is the house of God, is the temple of God. So you see what has been corrupted here, speaking of this end of the age, is not just what we would call the church, not just the physical temple, but the whole house of Israel. We have been corrupted by the Babylonian system of economics and religion, and we must be cleansed. That's why everything that I've read so far in here, and you can keep on reading and you will find that about 99% of God's words of correction and chastisement and judgment are to Israel. It is true that much of the sin in Israel land is because of other people, non-Israelites. But the fault is Israel's. God never gave to the heathen and to the non-Israelite the authority or the responsibility to enforce his law. That was given to Israel. And just as we have seen in this land, when murderers and rapists are not put to death, they may be, and many times they are, of other races. But the fault is Israel's. It is Israel who must repent. Now the moneylenders and the usurers, I believe, will be destroyed, and I believe also that includes their agents. And I believe many of their agents are in the pulpits of the churches of America. Doing what? Teaching our people all sorts of things 
except about the greatest sin of Israel, economic injustice, robbery, and plunder in the land, which leads to and aggravates all other sins. Well, I believe this is going to be done. The correction is going to be done. And someone will ask, well, when will it be done? I believe it will not be done until Israel, as a people, turn and repent of this terrible sin in the land. Israel must repent before God will then do what he says he will do. Turn back to Acts 20, and let's read that again. I want to close in the same verses that I started with because I believe that Paul could tell these Christian people of repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ because he had done what he said here. He had preached to them the whole counsel of God. Now, I believe sincerely that God Almighty has put something in the Israel people that when they are shown truly their wicked ways through the whole counsel of God and through God's preaching, which is the debt and the trouble and the enemy nations coming against us, they will turn from their wicked ways. But we simply have not heard the whole counsel of God in America for at least a hundred years. Let's begin in verse 20 again. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul is saying in effect that every house in Ephesus had heard this truth, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. The preachers in America, at least some of them, are going to have to reach a point where they do not fear being placed in bonds. Now, I'm sure that many Men in America today know the truth that is preached by a few, but they will not preach it out of fear of being placed in bonds, arrested or whatever. Paul was not afraid of that. Therefore, he spoke the truth necessary for Israel. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The grace of God, of course, is what? God's manifestation of mercy upon Israel when they repent. He will blot out their sins and give them the kingdom. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. America needs all the counsel of God. Israel needs to hear all the counsel of God. And when Israel hears that, Israel will be, I believe, appalled at what the sin and iniquity of America and the rest of Christendom is. Our good brethren in Canada labor under the same thing. Our people in Europe all labor under the same Babylonian economic system which has permeated our government, politics, and even religion to the extent that we labor under this captivity. Turn to John 14. In verse 15, Jesus said, very simply, If ye love me, keep my commandments. If we have faith in Jesus Christ, we certainly should repent of the violation of God's commandments. For you all know, even if most of Israel does not yet know, or at least does not yet realize, that Jesus was the God at Mount Sinai who commanded, Thou shalt not steal, and then gave them laws showing them that usury was theft. It was stealing. That was Jesus that gave Israel those laws. Jesus was the God who sent the prophets to rebuke our fathers who had allowed thievery in the land of Israel. Jesus was the God who told the unfaithful servant that the interest of the bankers was thievery. 
Jesus was the God who says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And thank God, Jesus was the God who went in the temple and drove out and overturned and destroyed the records of the money changers in ancient Israel and will do so in end time Israel. He will destroy the money changers in this land when we turn and repent of what we have allowed to happen in this land. Now one final thought. Some of you think, well, I have never participated in this or since I learned about it, I have gotten away from it and I don't participate in this Babylonian system of economics. Well, I have news for you. God holds every one of us as a sinner in this because then God's mercy is greater when he forgives every one of us when we repent as Israel. You see, in the final analysis, repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ is one and the same thing. We must realize Jesus is Jehovah of the Bible. He is one God and only one of Israel. And when we get that in our hearts and see what we have done, in the sight of God in this great and merciful God who has promised us the kingdom, I believe we will see a repentance in Israel that even the prophets of old would have been startled to see. And I think the day is fast approaching. Praise God. Let's stand. Our Father and our God, we thank you for thy great promise of mercy that even as we see these things that we have done, that we've sinned against thee, we've turned away from thy law, we've broken thy commandments, that even as we see them and turn and repent, thou shalt blot them out, thou shalt turn and cast them into the depths of the sea, and they shall be known no more, and thou shalt bring us into the kingdom. We thank you for it, that thou hast paid that price for our sins. We praise your name in Jesus Christ. Amen.